Good morning, church family. Today is Palm and Passion Sunday. Jesus has come to Jerusalem, and the people came out with the palm branches in their hands. Just imagine that Jesus is coming to our town today, and let us welcome him with the palm leaves in our hands. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Let us worship God and praise Jesus with all our hearts, minds, and spirits together. Let us begin our service with an opening hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, hymn number 64. People of God, come in the spirit of one who did not count on equality with God as a thing to be grasped. Come ready to empty ourselves of all that cuts us off from the discipleship of Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. O oh Lord Jesus, today we remember the day over 2,000 years ago that you entered Jerusalem riding on a simple donkey rather than in a warrior's chariot of conquest. The people shouted loud hosannas, waved palm branches, and greeted you with, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. However, you knew that within a few days, these same people would betray you, and demand your death by crucifixion. O oh, Jesus, we know that on the cross you forgave them, and please forgive us. We earnestly pray that we never give in to the power of evil. Help us to keep our steadfast faith in you. Lord, be with us in our life's journey, and help us to overcome the darkness of sin and to move ahead, remembering the love you have for us that conquered even death. O oh, Holy Jesus, Lamb of God, we want to be near you during this painful and sorrowful week. With your guidance and love, we pray that our souls will be drawn from the sufferings of daily life to the triumph and the joy of your resurrection on Easter morning. Lord, open your loving arms and gently embrace us that we may become the disciples you need us to be. Amen. Let us have a moment of a silent meditation and a prayer.
hear the words of assurance. Jesus Christ has faced and conquered death itself, saving us with a steadfast love that will not let us go. Receive the mind of Christ and let your tongues confess your faith and trust in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us lift up the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's anthem, The Palms, will be dedicated by Rex and Deborah Endlin and Heather Edwards Wilson. Thank you, Rex, Deborah, and Heather. 
Thank you. Today's children's message will be delivered by Bill and Maddie Otto. Bill and Maddie. Good morning, children, and a blessed, happy Palm Sunday to you. At our church here in Lake Ronkonkoma, as we prepare for Holy Easter Week celebrations, we're here to start off the day with a message on Palm Sunday. Maddie will give you today's message wherein Jesus enters into Jerusalem and why that is significant to us. Jesus came to save, but not always in the way people expected. He came to deliver us from sin, but some people anticipated a much more immediate rescue. Now, Maddie, go on with your story. Hip, hip, hooray, Hosanna, whoo-hoo, and a good morning to everyone. So, I was reading, I was skimming over today's gospel story, story, and I found out it was something about waving branches, riding a donkey, and people being all excited. Let's talk about that for a moment. See, what happened here in Jerusalem was like a big parade for Jesus. Although he didn't ride on a big, big foot or fancy car, he rode through town on a donkey, which was just a normal work animal. Why was this important? Because it showed Jesus was coming humbly and in peace. He was not coming alone and not coming as, and not as a king with an army. Now, while Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, people lined up to, to welcome him. They threw their coats on the ground, sort of like a fancy red carpet, but it also showed that but it also showed that their people respected Jesus and considered him their king. They waved their palm branches, sort of like you would at, at wave a flag at a big parade celebration. Palm, the palm branches showed happiness and celebration and were a sign of victory. The people wanted Jesus to bring victory and good things to all immediately. While the people were celebrating, the people lining up the path were also shouting something. Do you know what that is? They, were sh they shouted, Hosanna. Do you know what that means? It means save us. The people wanted Jesus to save them, and they expected that he, would not be, that he would be able to do it. Jesus did come to save, but he, would, but he was not exactly in the way that the people anticipated. The people in Jerusalem thought that Jesus was, was going to be an earthly king and save them from all political oppressors who were always mistreating them. Now, as we know, that didn't happen because even though Jesus rode into town triumphantly, by Friday, he was nailed to the cross, died, and arose on Easter Sunday. He wasn't saving them from the political oppression, but he was saving them from something much bigger and in a way that was much better. It was better than anyone could have imagined or hoped for, and it was forever. Thanks, Maddie. You know, children, sometimes we want to put our own expectations on Jesus, too. Maybe we have an idea of how we think or how he should answer our prayers or how he should work in our lives. We get confused or upset when God's ways don't always look like we would hope. When we do this, we miss the true joy that is to be found in him alone, and we should always be assured and remember that God has much bigger plans in mind for each of us. He has delivered us, and he continues to do so. Our job is to continue following and praising him. We want to proclaim the amazing works of Jesus and tell everyone how wonderful he is and to let our lives, as well as our words and actions, declare his absolute power. And now, let's please offer our thanks that God has saved us, and please join us in a closing prayer. Dear God, thank you for saving us. Thank you for your work in our lives. Even, on the, even in unexpected ways, help us to always praise your holy name. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. And now, children, remember the Easter egg hunt right after church this morning. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Bill and Maddie, for your inspiring children's message this morning. Thank you. 
Now it's time to share our joys and lift up our concerns and prayers. Joys. Bill and Maureen Mitchell's daughter Suzanne has a baby boy, Liam Douglas Kamora. He was born on March 21st. Congratulations and lots of blessings. George Dukas' knee replacement surgery went very well. Thanks be to God. Here are some concerns and prayer requests. Helen Mulvihill's former husband, Drew Mulvihill, passed away on March 13th in Massachusetts and had his funeral service in Long Island on March 17th. We send our deep condolences and prayers to his family. Unfortunately, Helen Mulvihill recently fell at home and is going through a very difficult time. Please keep Helen in your prayers. Jerry June went through a lung test a couple of weeks ago, but still needs more tests. We hope and pray that all goes well with him. Ray and Marilyn Beck's grandson Jason came home from college in order to treat his kidney problems. We keep praying for this young man to be healed soon. Please continue to pray for these friends for their speedy recovery. Tom Siobhan, Carolyn Ferry, Rosemary Heiserer, her sister Amelia, and her son-in-law Randy, and Joan Schmidt. Let us pray. O oh God of life, as we still worship you at our homes due to the coronavirus pandemic situation, may the Holy Spirit help us to remember solemnly the suffering of Jesus and his final triumph over death. That will give us strength and faith to go through this hard time with hopes and visions. O oh Lord, we come before you with our heavy heart this morning, and we lift up the prayers for our country. We've heard the incredibly sad news that the shootings happened in Atlanta, Georgia, and Boulder, Colorado, killed so many innocent people. How long, O oh Lord, do we have to endure the violence and injustice? On top of the coronavirus pandemic, we are suffering through these injustifiable tragedies. We don't know where to turn. We are helpless, hopeless, and voiceless. May the Holy Spirit console the families and friends of those victims during this difficult and challenging time. Lord, help us to stop violence and force against any ethnic groups. That's a sin against your will. O oh God, remember all our congregants and their families. You've heard the names we lifted up to you. Lord, weep with those who are in any form of pain, who lost their loved ones, who lost their livelihood. Please comfort them with your love, mercy, and grace. As our shepherd, please continue to guide us, lead us, and bless us. We earnestly pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Today's lecture is Christina Otto, and she will read today's scripture lessons. Christina? Good morning. Our first reading is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
The second reading is Mark 14, 1 through 16. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be a tumult of the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. But there were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment thus wasted? For this ointment might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they reproached her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you, and whatever you will, you can do good to them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burying. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the householder, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, and where am I to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. They prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city, and found it as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the next hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, United Methodist Hymnal, number 297. Sunday today because we're commemorating both 
Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday together. We celebrate Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem triumphantly. At the same time, we commemorate the Sunday of the Passion, the Sunday before the week of Jesus' Passion, the Sunday before his suffering and death. Many things are happening this week. In today's lectionary reading in Mark's Gospel, Jesus' Passion stories take up two full chapters, chapters 14 and 15. However, since there are so many events going on in both the chapters today, I'd like to focus on one, Mark chapter 14, 1 through 11. As we open Mark chapter 14, we immediately recognize the signs of plotting and betrayal. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to persecute Jesus, but they had not acted on this plot because they were afraid of people rioting during their religious holidays. Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. Now, Jesus was about to have a meal at the house of Simon the leper in Bethany. Simon the leper was one of those who were cured of his leprosy by Jesus. Bethany is a small village located less than two miles southeast of Jerusalem. The meaning of Bethany is house of figs. It seemed that this village was not a very luxurious place and the people lived there were not wealthy. However, all of a sudden, an anonymous woman appeared at Simon the leper's house and started anointing Jesus' head with an alabaster-colored jar of very expensive perfume. Then Jesus' disciples rebuked her harshly because they thought that she was wasting this expensive perfume. However, Jesus was so impressed and touched by her warm and appreciative action, so he told his disciples to leave her alone. Then Jesus added, I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. What Jesus said awakened me. What's happening here? Who is this woman and why did Jesus bless her? What did she do that was so special? Here, one of the things I noticed was that what Jesus said had not been carried out. Even though Jesus said that wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Sorry, Jesus. I don't think that we Christians have ever recognized her that much. Have we? Did you? We don't even know her name and we don't lift her up. Well, in Mark's gospel, this woman remains anonymous. But in John's gospel in chapter 12, she was Mary, sister of Martha and Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Even though there's no proof that these two women in Mark's gospel and John's gospel were the same person, what they did was very significant in Christian history. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus' passion begins with a woman anointing Jesus' head, and Jesus praised her as a model disciple. Later, in chapter 16 in Mark, 
more women were waiting to anoint Jesus' dead body for burial. While Jesus' disciples didn't have any clue about his future suffering, death, and resurrection, these women anointed Jesus. Jesus' disciples didn't understand Jesus' message. They only focused on their positions, arguing about who is the greatest among them. They insisted that they will never betray Jesus. But they did. Since they were so ignorant and their minds were somewhere else, they say that what this woman did to Jesus was a big waste and rebuked her. Listen to what they said. Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. According to the commentaries, at that time, one denarius was a man's daily wage. If it was a year's wages, it meant that the cost would be more than 300 denarii. If we calculate the cost of this perfume in our contemporary currency, it might be about $40,000 or so. To ordinary people, it's an astronomical number even now. At first, the disciples' objection sounded good and practical. Yes, it makes more sense to help the poor. However, the cost of the perfume was not the point to hear. For example, Judas Iscariot objected to it because Seemingly, he cared about the poor, but in reality, because he was a thief and keeper of the money bag, he helped himself to the money in the bag. However, can we blame Judas Iscariot because he was the betrayer of Jesus? I don't think so. Usually, our minds immediately start to contemplate cost. We ask ourselves, how practical is it? How much does it cost? Is it worth? How much can we profit from it? What benefit do I get from it? Even though we deny that we don't ask and act like that, unconsciously, we think like that. I am wondering how we estimate our commitment to Jesus in this way. How practical is it for me to give my life to Jesus Christ? Maybe the cost is too high and I should reconsider my commitment, dedication, sacrifice, and contribution. I've heard a saying many times that most people want to serve God but only as advisors. They don't want to act, but give advice to others. It's no wonder this anonymous woman didn't consult anyone before her action. She just showed up and did what she believed to be right thing for her Messiah. I'm glad that she didn't ask Jesus' disciples first to get the permission. If she asked Jesus' staff first, her request would have been denied and declined. I'm glad that she just showed up without an appointment and did an unselfish thing that pleased Jesus. In a way, her action was a foretelling Jesus' future, though no one knew it at that time. It was apparent, though, that this woman was a woman of wisdom and faith. She knew the right time and place to express her faith. By pouring a very expensive perfume made out of pure oil over Jesus' head, she was symbolically proclaiming Jesus to be the Messiah, the anointed one of God. 
Messiah literally means the anointed one. It is interesting to see the situation developed here. Jesus was anointed as the Messiah, not by emperors, governors, even his disciples, but by an unknown woman. This anointing didn't happen in a palace or the temple on Mount Zion, but in the humble house of Nazareth, who has brought back from death by Jesus, according to John's gospel, or Simon the leper, who was cured by Jesus, according to Mark's gospel. Jesus was not anointed in a huge city like Jerusalem, but in a small village like Bethany. It confirms the character and the nature of a humble Jesus. Jesus said that the poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. This woman understood what Jesus meant. She knew that she was living in Kronos time, which is chronological time on earth where the poor will be there all the time and she will have endless opportunities to help them out. However, she also knew that Jesus was living in Kairos time, which is ticking according to God's will. Therefore, she understood that she will not have Jesus on earth forever. She didn't want to lose the last opportunity to catch Jesus and anointing him with the best quality perfume, the most expensive possession she had to acknowledge the identity of Jesus as the Messiah. When she poured out this expensive perfume, we can imagine that the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Of course, this wonderful fragrance would cover the odors from sweaty bodies and dirty feet, smells from food, humid air, and the sewer. The fragrance came from an expensive perfume. This is true. But memory of the evaporated perfume remained from her act of love and respect for Jesus. There is a certain beauty in uncalculating, unconditional love. That's why Jesus pointed out that the beautiful thing she had done to him. This woman's uncalculating, uncal unselfish, generous, kind, timely gift springs from a personal love, respect, and faith for Jesus. That's why her act was beautiful and the fragrance was so powerful and wonderful. The extremely generous self-giving fragrance of this woman is contrasted with the cheap, selfish, clueless, and insensitive fragrance of Jesus' disciples. However, because of her action, the sweetest, the most wonderful, beautiful, priceless, and self-giving fragrance is from Jesus Christ. Can we ever outgive God? The cross is the greatest example of a holy waste the world has ever known. And the smell of blood Jesus poured out for us on the cross is the most valuable, noble, favorable, beautiful fragrance we can keep in our heart, our mind, our spirit, and our memory forever. Friends, can we smell the fragrance of a perfume from this unknown woman's alabaster jaw? Can we smell the fragrance from Jesus' holy sacrificial cross? And 
can we smell the same fragrance in our body, our home, our church, our workplace, our community, and our world. At the same time, we should ask ourselves what kind of a fragrance we carry with us. What kind of a fragrance we carry with us. I've heard that one of the serious symptoms of the COVID-19 virus is losing the sense of smell. I hope and pray that we not only get the vaccine shot to get rid of the COVID-19 virus, but also get the vaccine shot of Jesus' love to get rid of the sin virus in our heart and regain the sense of smell to smell the fragrance of his love. With that thought in mind, let us have a meaningful Holy Week. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now let us sing our closing hymn, Hymn of Promise, number 707. In the bowl there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From a past will come the future, what it holds a mystery, unrevealed until it's season, something God alone. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death a resurrection, and at last a victory, unrevealed until it Let us pray. People of God, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bless you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Now, let me make a couple of announcements. This year, our Holy Week services will be held online. Monday, Thursday with the communion on April 1st at 7.30 p.m. Good Friday service on April 2nd at 7.30 p.m. Easter Sunday with the communion on April 4th at 10 a.m. Please join us as we worship together on these most significant days on the Christian calendar. For more information on this year's Spring Festival and Flower Sale, please visit our website, www.umclr.com, and scroll down to the bottom right, for flower order form and for more details. Thank you.
My beloved congregation, please remember to join us for Holy Week services. Until we meet again, please take good care of yourselves and be well. Shalom to you and goodbye. Thank you.